Hello and welcome to Managing the Decompensating Patient. My name is David Woodruff. I'm the editor of Critical Care Nursing Made Incredibly Easy. I hope to make this incredibly easy for you too. We're talking about decompensating patients. Well, the best way to be able to manage your decompensating patient is to recognize those signs of impending crisis early on and prevent them. So then what do we do? We see that the patient is decompensating and we need to implement some interventions. What are the best interventions to be doing in what situations? Well, first of all, let's go through our ABCs or ACBs as the case may be. We're going to start with our airway. So we need to decide when it is that we're going to tube the patient or when we're just going to use some other airway adjuncts. Let's take a look at some of them. First is the basic airway adjunct of the oropharyngeal airway. The oropharyngeal airway, as is illustrated in this picture here, you can see how it goes down behind the tongue to help to keep the tongue off of the back of the throat. What tends to happen as patients start to lose consciousness, so as they become hypoxic and they start to lose consciousness, we're going to have the loosening up of those muscles and the lower jaw and the tongue are going to tend to fall backward possibly occluding the airway and making it difficult or impossible for the patient to breathe. So we're going to want to open that up by using an oral pharyngeal airway. As you can see from the photo here, the oral pharyngeal airway is holding that tongue and the lower jaw from the back of the throat so that we have an airway that goes down into the lungs. Obviously, as you can probably see from the diagram as well, that if we're putting this in somebody who's conscious, it's going to cause a lot of gagging. So this is typically used in our patients who are unconscious. If we need to put in an oral airway or an upper airway uh, for a patient who is conscious or semi-conscious, we probably want to move into our nasal pharyngeal airway. This causes less gagging and can be used in our conscious or semi-conscious patient. If you look at the picture on the right, you can see how the placement of the nasal pharyngeal airway goes. It's kind of a soft, rubbery type of a tube that's placed in the nares, and it goes down to the back of the oral pharynx, and it helps to hold that tongue and the lower jaw away from the back of the throat so that we have an open airway going down into the patient's lungs. Another type of an airway, and again, this would be used in someone who is unconscious because this is going to go down into the patient's esophagus, and we can't really uh, intubate the esophagus and blow up these balloons without having a lot of gagging occurring with the patient. So this protects the airway, and what it does is we have two different balloons. So we, the tube is placed into the esophagus. And then you see there's a little balloon at the end of that tube. That blows up in the esophagus, sealing off the esophagus. Then there is another balloon that's up higher. That balloon is going to seal off the upper airway. Now there's a hole in between those two, two balloons. There's a hole, and that hole is going to allow air to go down into the lungs. So that's what's actually going to ventilate the lungs is the hole in the side of the tube between those two balloons. There's also another port so that we could stick a catheter down and suction down into the esophagus and suction out the stomach. Next, we also have a laryngeal mask airway. The laryngeal mask airway is usually used by anesthesia for short-term anesthesia that's needed for patients. This airway goes down, and the mask piece here fits over the larynx, so it's fitting over the beginning of the trachea, and we're able to seal that off and be able to prevent the patient from being able to aspirate. So it's a little different technology, a little different uh, system, provides a good airway for a short period of time. However, it's not super stable. I mean, we can't leave it in forever. We have a lot of pressure caused by the balloon, and we also have a situation where it's not completely sealing for the patient to possibly have any kind of regurgitation and aspiration. Then we'd have to move to endotracheal intubation. In endotracheal intubation, we're placing a tube into the trachea. So it's going through the mouth of the nose down into the trachea, blowing up a balloon that's going to seal the trachea so that we can push air into the patient's lungs. In theory, 
you could blow up that balloon so that the patient would not have any aspiration risk. However, if we blow that balloon up too much, we're going to cause too much pressure on the trachea and cause necrosis of the trachea. Therefore, we have to maintain a little bit of an air leak around that balloon in order to make sure that we're getting adequate perfusion to the tissues where the balloon is. That also creates a potential aspiration risk, although having the balloon inflated is going to greatly decrease the risk of aspiration should the patient vomit. We still have the potential that some aspirate could get around the balloon and down into the trachea, so we still want to be careful about suctioning that upper airway, that upper pharynx. All right, well, now we got the airway in place. So how are we going to manage this patient's ventilation? We've gone through all our oxygenation. Now, obviously, that would be our first line of defense. And using a venti mask, like it's shown here, or maybe moving right into a non-rebreather mask. And then we're moving into some method of ventilation, such as CPAP, BiPAP, or the mechanical ventilator. Let's take a look at each of those to talk about how they might work. So the first one is CPAP, and CPAP is going to increase our residual volume, which then increases oxygenation for our patient. So let's take a look at the diagram here. And what you can see on that diagram on the left is the volumes within the lung. So the normal breathing, as you're just breathing in and out right now, that's your tidal volume. Tidal volume is just a very small part of our total lung volume. But this is the part that's going to circulate the air that is down there toward the bottom in the expiratory reserve and the residual volume. So let's just kind of do a little exercise here for a moment and think about the volumes in your lung. As you're just breathing in and out casually at rest, that's your tidal volume. Now, you can take a very deep breath, right? That's your inspiratory reserve. So your inspiratory reserve is going to be larger than your tidal volume. In other words, we have some room to be able to manipulate the patient's tidal volume if we need to try to move more air. We also have an expiratory reserve. So normally, we're not blowing out all the air in our lung. However, from your tidal volume, you could start from an exhalation, a casual exhalation, and still blow more air out of your lungs. That's your expiratory reserve. We are never blowing out the residual volume. The residual volume's down there holding those alveoli open so they don't collapse, and that would be a big problem. Then we have to try and re-recruit all those alveoli with every breath, which is pretty impossible to do. So our normal volume as you're breathing casually and resting is your tidal volume. We have an inspiratory reserve, an expiratory reserve, which we will enact in, in many cases with exercise and things like that. And then we have the residual volume that sits down there at the bottom. What CPAP does, it's continuous air, positive airway pressure, and continuous positive airway pressure increases the residual volume, the part at the bottom. Why that's important is remember the residual volumes, the part that's sitting in the alveoli all the time. If we increase the amount of air that is sitting in the alveoli all the time, we'll have more oxygen available for perfusion. So therefore, we'll increase oxygenation. The picture to the right is showing one method of delivery of CPAP. This would be kind of a common method of delivery if the patient was acutely ill, where we would use a mask that goes over the nose and mouth. In patients who are less acutely ill, we might just use a nose mask or nose pillows. Next, we have BiPAP. BiPAP is delivered in exactly the same way. The thing that's different about BiPAP is that we've added pressure support to CPAP. So we still have the benefits of CPAP. You see the residual volume piece is going to still be increased, and we're going to still have an increase in oxygenation. But we're also going to increase our tidal volume by providing pressure support. Pressure support provides some positive pressure during inspiration to make it easier for that patient to be able to take a breath. So what we're going to do is make that tidal volume bigger. If the tidal volume is bigger, we're moving more air, and that's going to blow off CO2. So depending on what your patient's need is, if they just need oxygen, CPAP may be appropriate. If we need to blow off that CO2 too, then we would also probably need to add BiPAP. Well, in some cases, the patient may just need mechanical ventilation. We may not be able to manage this uh, with CPAP or BiPAP. Our non-invasive ventilation may not be adequate. What mechanical ventilation does is that we can manipulate almost every component of this diagram. We can increase the tidal volume, we can increase the rate, we can increase the residual volume, 
So we can add CPAP to our mechanical ventilation. In mechanical ventilation, when we add CPAP, that's called PEEP, positive end expiratory pressure. We can add pressure support, that's increasing our tidal volume, or we can add a tidal volume and we can add a rate. So we can manipulate both the oxygenation and the CO2 while at the same time having a definite airway, a secure airway in an endotracheal tube so that we can manipulate all of these different functions. So when do we use what? The first question we need to ask is, does the patient have a patent airway? Then we need to ask, what is the expected duration of therapy? Do we expect it to be greater than 48 hours or less than 48 hours? Those are our two questions we're going to ask to help us determine if we're intubating or if we're using a mask for our type of therapy. So let's start out with a patent airway. The patient has a patent airway. Yes, okay, we're going to use a mask. Will the therapy be less than 48 hours? Now, if not, then we're going to move over to the other side there and we're going to intubate and use mechanical ventilation. However, you've probably seen some patients recently who may be on mask therapy, CPAP or BiPAP, for a longer period of time than 48 hours. We're seeing a lot of this with some types of infections and pneumonias, and we're using mask therapy for longer periods of time. Just be careful because the mask itself can cause skin breakdown. So we want to be careful about it. That's why we're asking this question about 48 hours. If we have somebody who's severely ill and has sepsis, etc., and they're hemodynamically unstable, it's unlikely that we're going to turn that around in 48 hours. We probably need to intubate and ventilate. If the patient's oxygenation status and their CO2 are really out of whack and we're not correcting that with CPAP or BiPAP, then again, we need to move over and, ven and intubate and ventilate. Okay, now we got all this oxygen into the bloodstream. Yay! All right, well, we need to move that to the tissues. It doesn't do us any good just to have oxygen sitting there in the lungs, so we need to get it to the tissues. I like to think about this concept by thinking about the ventilation perfusion train. What the ventilation perfusion train says here is that we're moving people from station A on the left to station B on the right. In order to do that, we're going to have to have a locomotive here with enough cars on the train to be able to move all those people. So let me give you an example. Let's say we have a thousand people at station A. We need to move them over to station B, and we only have one tiny little car on the train. Well, it's not going to cut it. We're not going to bring all those thousand people over. Well, we can have all the cars on the train we want, but if there's no locomotive, it's not going anywhere, and we're still not getting those people over to station B. Here's how it works in the, in the body, is with the ventilation perfusion train, first we have to get that oxygen to the lungs. That's what we were talking about with our airway and our breathing, getting it to the lungs first. Now that it's there, we need to move that oxygen to the tissues of the body. That's the cars in the train is the hemoglobin. So the cars in the train are hemoglobin. We have to have an adequate amount of hemoglobin to be able to get oxygen to the tissues. Now this begs the question that, well, if the hemoglobin level is low, why wouldn't we just give this patient blood? And let's bump that hemoglobin level up. Well, there are complications to giving blood. Every time you give blood to a patient, you're going to increase inflammation in the body because the body is going to have an inflammatory response to that blood product. And that can cause more complications than having the low hemoglobin level. So it's a balance. Next, we can have all the hemoglobin in the world, but if there's no cardiac output, it's not going anywhere. It's just sitting there, right? So we have to have an adequate cardiac output to be able to move the hemoglobin to the tissue so that we can use that oxygen. Lastly, we brought all this oxygen to the tissue, but if the need at the tissue level was for twice as much, we still didn't meet the need. So we have to make sure that we're decreasing our tissue oxygen consumption Two main things you can do at the bedside to decrease tissue oxygen consumption. One is to decrease fever. Secondly, decrease activity. Those two things are going to increase tissue oxygen consumption. For example, you got a patient with a fever who's also shivering using a lot of oxygen. We want to try and decrease those activities so that we're not using as much oxygen at the tissue level. Then hopefully our oxygenation to the tissue will be sufficient to meet the need. So some of the things that we use to help us to improve perfusion include fluids, pressures, and, of course, there's consequences to each. If we give our patient lots and lots of fluids, they're going to end up blowing up like the Michelin man, right? Full of fluid. 
So there's disadvantages to using a lot of IV fluids or colloids or even blood products. As I mentioned before, every time we give a blood product to a patient, it causes an inflammatory response which could cause long-term complications. At the same time, there are complications with pressors. Remember that vasopressors, they don't know where you want that vasoconstriction to occur. They make it happen everywhere, including the vital organs. So we have to have a balance here in our resuscitation between the fluids and the pressors to maintain adequate perfusion. And we have to be careful about using endpoints like blood pressure because in its blood pressure is going to be different for each person, right? So we want to be careful about using endpoints like blood pressure to be able to determine whether or not our fluids and pressors are effective. We want to be looking at the individual perfusion of that patient to make sure that we're perfusing their organs because each of these therapies is going to have its own set of complications that could be very difficult to be able to reverse. Thank you for joining me for Managing the Decompensating Patient. My name is David Woodruff. Until next time, bye now.